thank you all for coming out uh, to hear us talk today about August Wilson. And it is, I've got to say, a pleasure really to be here with Constanza and to have a chance for us to talk with you about mm -hmm. uh, August, who's, as you all know, is simply amazing in terms of what he did. Uh, Constanza revealed to me that I was something that I didn't know. He was the most produced playwright in 2016. He was the most produced playwright in the first decade of the 20, uh, 21st century and the most produced playwright in the 1990s. So a show of hands, how many people have seen the movie Fences? Raise your hand if you've seen the movie. Yeah, great. Right. We're going to get to that. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, show of hands, how many people have seen all 10 plays of the American Century Cycle? <laughs> Wow. Well, that's, that's good. <laughs> You're going to have opportunities. <laughs> so uh, you heard a little bit, uh, just mentioned that, uh, Constanza, you met August Wilson uh, here. So can yes, we have a little bit more of that story? Yeah. <laughs> By the way, I love um, the, t the title, Talking Around the Black Porch. August was a, a porch sitter. And uh, uh, sharing some stories with you will be a pleasure. Um, the day that I, that I had met August previously because we had had a uh, design conference, but the day that I first really started to speak one-on-one -on -one with August was October 19th, 1987. And the reason I remember that is because it was uh, the Black Monday. It was the, the stock market, market crash mm. in 87. Mm. And I remember it, you know, going, whoa, what's, what does that mean in my life? I was a young student um, in my 20s and, uh, uh, you know, trying hard as, as anything to uh, uh, fulfill all my responsibilities as a student at the Yale School of Drama. I was on my third year. My teachers had assigned me to, to design the piano lesson. And uh, we started speaking. It was a, a very cold evening. And we ran into each other. And we started to speak about the play. And it was on York and Chapel in front of uh, Gentry's. Do you, remember, do you guys remember mm. Gentry's? <laughs> yes, true. yes. And we, we stood out there talking so much because he was beginning to tell me um, how he he imagines scenes for his plays. He, he was a very visual person. So he told me, I want to start, I want to do a painting of a woman waiting at a train station and there's nothing else around. And, and because he would always ask himself, well, why is that woman standing at the train station? Where is she going? What's she leaving behind? What is, uh, what does she want to find when she gets there? You know, so, um, and I'm an artist, so we had a lot in common to talk about. And so we went into Gentry's and had dinner. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. I, well, I, I, since that was a courtship narrative, I, my, my own uh, courtship narrative uh, relates to August Wilson. I met my wife at August Wilson play. So... Uh, <laughs> What happened was I, I was actually up in Seattle, and uh, the University of Puget Sound had invited me to give a series of lectures up there and uh, as, as a distinguished visitor. And, and right before was an August Wilson play at the Seattle Rep, um, King Hedley. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, then the person who invited me came up to me and said, listen, um, we want you also to do this lecture on the Harlem Renaissance. And I'm thinking, I don't want to teach a class on the Harlem Renaissance. That wasn't part of the deal. Then my wife, wife Michelle, walked up and said, uh, I'm the teacher of the Harlem Renaissance course. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to teach that course. <laughs> so you mentioned, in, in terms of August, you mentioned this idea that he thought visually. What was his writing style, his writing ethic like? What was it like to see him then work on plays? Well, um, the fact that you use the word ethic makes me chuckle. <laughs> <laughs> he was a man who was a bit of a procrast procrastinator, and he um, uh, hated deadlines. He hated and was only able to work because of the deadline. Mm. And uh, so he, uh, you know, I, 
at first I thought he was going to be one of those writers that sits in front of the uh, typing machine and, you know, starts to write at five o'clock in the morning, that kind of ritual, and maybe rips out the page and make, you know, wads it up and throws it in the wastebasket and try again. Um, but he wasn't that kind of writer at all. He was uh, always thinking, always hearing people. It's if for, for any reason somebody said something that sp inspired him, he would just like, you know, record it in his mind. Uh, for, so what I say always is for him to live was to work and to work was to live. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to actually sit down and write, you know, it was like, I had, it was in the middle of the night sometimes, and I didn't see it. Um, uh, one time, my daughter and I, we took a trip for three weeks uh, to go to Colombia, where I was, where I'm from. And uh, I called him after two weeks being there, and I said, "So, how much have you written?" And he said, "Not a goddamn thing." <laughs> 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 so you you know it was it was uh i sometimes his his uh sometimes his work was miraculous you know he made it appear in the middle of the night yeah but but he always it, it was always you know gold mm -hmm. that he was able to come up with yeah. which is amazing he uh one of the things i i remember is uh uh, he talked about that the characters came alive for him in a way. And yes. Did he talk to you about that? I, I mean, remember uh, once he, he, hearing him, well, I'll talk about on Esther, but let yeah, you, yeah. you talk he, about that. Yeah, yeah, he often got visited by the characters he would write about. And uh, for any of you who have seen uh, Gem of the Ocean, uh, the character of on Esther came to him. And, you know, she was a very, very old woman. And she said... I talk about a lot of things, but I don't talk about the water. I don't talk about the water. And then she proceeded to talk only about the water. Mm. And uh, it, it turned out that she carried the memory of, of the Middle Passage. And she, in that play, is 285 years old. Um, so yeah, he, he, he heard them. Somehow he had an amazing gift of, of um, plugging himself into a greater, uh, his own cosmology of ideas, and he would whittle them down to, to be on paper. Yeah. What, what's amazing to me, and one of the things that drove me, you know, as a, as a scholar to his work, yes. are those things that you talked about. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I love the fact that he could tell the history of a people. And when you talk about history, it's usually the most important, you know, big people, famous people, or big uh, men, usually. But his stories were idiosyncratic. He'd focus on the lives of everyday black people, and through that, reach cross-cultural commonality, reach a universality in the stories that he told. And that he told the stories in terms of the past, looking at the choices African Americans made, but looking how that choice then impacts now. So the presence of the past in his work was really, really something that, uh, mm -hmm. that drove me in and, and really excited me in terms of his work. Were you already in the theater? I was in the theater. I, 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 I took a Constanza. I'm, I'm not an actor, and I, I wasn't very good. But uh, I acted in the second production, professional production, of his play, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. And, and this was in Washington, D.C., and as you can imagine, it was a hit. And it played, it was supposed to play for four weeks, it played through the summer. I played Ma's stuttering nep ne nephew, Sylvester. You know, he stutters in the play and finally says one line right, and uh, women would come up to me after the play, and particularly older women, they were like, let me hear you talk, son. And I was like, <laughs> I really can't talk all right. <laughs> so, but um, uh, because it was a second production, August came, came down to see it. And we had a, well, the theater had a reception for him. And there's this big reception, you know, for August Wilson. And rather being the center of this uh, the, um, event, he's at the side or at the back, just listening, observing, watching, talking to people who talked to him, but not needing to be the center. Was that true? Was he like that more? Oh, no. gosh, it's hard to... It's hard to tell because as time went by, he got more popular. And uh, so people would circle around him 
and he told amazing stories. He, you know, as you can imagine, he was an amazing storyteller. He mm. had his bag of jokes, you know, and they were good jokes. I, I, I can't remember a single one, <laughs> but he was, he was great at that. And, and uh, his whole entire family, I think, uh, built up this, this oral tradition um, that, you know, they would sit around the table telling jokes and fun, you know, they were funny and, and the afternoons would go into the late evenings that mm. way. Yeah. yeah, the the stories and the plays are just amazing. Yes, and uh, and one of the things I, I well, let's talk about you and him as, as, maybe as a designer. What was it like working with him then in the process as it came to fruition to being a play? Well, um, the uh, the first play that um, uh, I worked on with him by my side was Seven Guitars. Um, he was, uh, we both moved to Seattle at the time, and uh, I uh, got the wonderful experience. I mean, not many designers are able to work with a playwright, you know, while he's eating a sandwich by your, <laughs> by your drawing table. <laughs> so, you know, and he, he, he would love to come up and talk to me about the play or talk to me about other things. And um, so I felt like I knew the, the characters already. Mm -hmm. And uh, at one time, I remember he, I, I showed him a drawing that I had made, made for Red Carter, which was seven guitars. Um, and uh, it, it, the character, the, the drawing was very character driven. And uh, he looked at it and he looked at it up close and he said, I'm going to go downstairs and write the character so that it looks more like the sketch. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty special. Yeah. Um, and uh, then while we were working on um, Gem of the Ocean, uh, I was so involved with that process that uh, I found a whole bunch of visual research for him. I found a, a draw, uh, excuse me, a photograph of a woman who, an old woman who was getting her feet washed by a younger woman. And I showed it to August and he said, that's the perfect way to begin one of my scenes. Mm. And it's, it's to, you know, so, so we traded back and forth again, because of that first connection that I to told you about, because he was very visual and I am as well, so we, we really were able to have that kind of language with each other. And that's a great scene that came out of that it's in beautiful, Gem of the isn't Ocean. It? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you you mentioned writing for actors within that, and that's uh, or or also the process, I guess, that August went in terms of uh, taking a play, and it was a rather unique process where he would start a play here or elsewhere right. and, and move it around the country, yes. which isn't you know, something that we see other playwrights doing now, but was, it was very formative. And, and uh, it, it, one of the things I remember, um, I saw it the, the same King Headley. I saw it uh, uh, in Los Angeles. I'd, I'd seen it, as I mentioned to you all, in Seattle. And there was a line about uh, where this character, uh, it was Mr. at first in the play, that asked about having, do I have a halo around my head? And the line worked okay, but... I, I went to the show, and as it evolved, as he was taking it from these different sites and saw it in Washington, D.C., but by the time it got to D.C., he had switched that line from the character Mr. to the title character, King Headley, and it worked so much better. I mean, it just made profound sense, and it was like that sort of process of working through um, as he went around the country and as he saw uh, different uh, places where the play was, that he was really engaged with that process. Absolutely. I think he, um, he and Lloyd Richards and uh, uh, a, another person that also taught at Yale, Ben Mordecai, he, the three of them really hit a sweet spot in the history of American theater. And that sweet spot was that August started his plays here, and um, other repertory theaters around the country said, well, why don't you come here and uh, we'll develop a play, you know, let's say at, um, in Los Angeles or Seattle Rep or the Huntington or the Goodman 
or uh, the Kennedy Center. You know, so why don't you, along the way, stop here before you go to Broadway? And so it was. It was basically a uh, like a locomotive. It it picked up. You know, it it started here, and the play continued to be developed, and it, it evolved um, slowly. And as as Harry was talking about the. Um, uh, August had the luxury of playing around, and it it reminded me a little bit of Shakespeare, you know, as he's working with the actors right alongside with him. Uh, I know that he molded and he tailored some of the some of the speeches, some of the monologues, some of the 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 the. the character traits for the actors that he was working mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. He had a few very, very favorite actors, um, and those were the ones that stayed with him. And, and um, one time I started to call them Wilsonian. And <laughs> the Wilsonians, mm -hmm. and uh, August loved it, so it stuck. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it, it, so by the time these plays got to Broadway, they were a really well-oiled machine. And uh, just the actors had already internalized all the dialogue and all the, the little subtle things that you cannot get, you can't get there just by having three weeks of rehearsal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a whole, with August plays, um, the, uh, the world of the play is so full of details and and you you can you can't ever research enough. You can't ever think of things enough because because one thing will lead you to thirty more. So so that's that was the sweet that's spot. Great. Yeah. You mentioned this. No I love this notion of Wilsonians, and I like the connection to Shakespeare as well. Because just like I mean, learning to act Shakespeare is a very specific talent, and you know you have Shakespearean actors who've been trained to do that. There's a certain skill that's necessary to do the work of August Wilson, and not every you know black actor can do it. No. Um, and so having those ones that do it well, and and yes, you know I remember that with uh, Charles Rock Dutton, who was the first Levy in um, uh, in on Broadway and here at Yale in terms of Ma Rainey's Black Bottom and um, the part after that, the part then in, that he played in Piano Lesson was one that he somewhat yes. crafted to Charles Rock Dutton. Um, Dutton, um, interestingly, uh, talked about uh, uh, him playing in Ma Rainey. If you know Ma Rainey, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it later, but if you know Ma Rainey, it's a play that uh, either needs actors who can play instruments or musicians who can act. And so um, for that Broadway production, after the Yale production, you know, which, which, which featured uh, Charles Rock Dutton, on Broadway he had to audition again, and um, uh, they also auditioned all sorts of famous trumpet players for that part, as he tells it. And uh, he got the part, because the trumpet players he, he, he couldn't do it, even you know, Miles Davis. Um, and, uh, uh, but a review came out in the, the Times talking about how well he fingered as if he could play. And that got, I think, the, the, as he tells it, the trumpet players upset, you know, so they all went to see it and sat in front of him as he played. <laughs> so one night, no, Miles no Davis pressure. was there. <laughs> and Miles Davis was there, and then afterwards, Miles Davis came back to his dressing room and said to Charles Rock Dutton, excuse my language, you can't play for shit. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that sense of uh, uh, the, the, the story there, but being a Wilsonian and um, being the, w I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, an uh, another play, and that's Jitney, which just came yes. to uh, to Broadway at mm -hmm. last. In, in terms of that, something you were really involved with, and if uh, you could talk about the in, in terms of actors and Shakespeare connection, the the lead actor in that was is a well known Shakespearean actor, yes. but you saw that he got cast. Well. Um, he he, uh, the, the name of this gentleman is, um, uh, what is John, John Douglas Thompson. Thompson. Oh my God, I can't believe I had a <laughs> blank. Um, John Douglas Thompson. He played um, uh, Loomis for the uh, Mark Taper production of Joe Turner's Come and Gone. And that was directed by Felicia Rashad. 
and um, Felicia and I are, are friends, and, and she uh, has become a really uh, wonderful director, uh, especially with the work of August Wilson. Uh, so she cast John, and I saw him, and I just said, I have to remember this actor. He, he was so good. Um, and then when we started casting Jitney, I told the people at the MTC, the Manhattan Theater Club, listen, I don't want John Douglas Thompson's name to leave this, this list until he auditions. Um, because I just really wanted him to have a chance at playing Becker, who, who's the father role, the, the center role of the play. And uh, so we, they, they whittled down people until it was John Douglas Thompson, uh, number two and number three. And they all came to audition and uh, they, uh, they said, oh my God, John blew it out of the water. Mm. And uh, they, they, t they said, you called it, you called it, you called it. And I felt like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like I felt great. great to have a little, you know, something to do with all this. And he, he got a Tony nomination. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. We, we were remarking on uh, the, the journey of uh, Jitney to Broadway since it yeah. had been there earlier. And it was interesting when it was there earlier. Um, it got a, a, a Brantley in the New York Times gave it one review when it was there earlier. Was it early 90? Yeah. Early 2000, two, whenever it was, 2000? Yeah, it was, uh, I would say, 90. Uh, 98, actually. Okay. Yeah, 97, somewhere around there. And there his review was okay. I mean, it was, he said it was good, but he said it was of a young playwright because this was a play that he wrote early and then went back to. And when he returned to it, interestingly enough, when he re and returned to it, and, and the stories that, as Constanza was saying, you know, that, that he wrote along the way, well, he was uh, working on, on the, the rehearsals for... Uh, the, the earlier version of it, and an actor had said to him, you know, no one's going to think this is an August Wilson play. And he said, why? And the, the, the actor said, because there's no monologues in it. And he, he went back and he wrote some. Sharpened his, <laughs> he sharpened so, his pencil. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> but the, the, the other, the, the review of the Broadway production was glowing. You know, in, yes. in terms of it. So it, it, the perception changed in some ways, but also the production and the director it was, um, uh, and, and maybe if you could talk a little bit about the chain of directors who worked with August sure, along the sure. way. Sure, sure. Great question. Um, I think that you can trace the, um, the August Wilson uh, journey as an artist, as a, as a writer, um, with the directors that he had. You know, he was a very young uh, writer straight out of the O'Neill Center. Um, when he, f you know, he uh, applied to go there with Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. And it was chosen. And it was, you know, like everybody was like with their mouth open going, whoa, what a play. And it came here to, to Yale and... Uh, Basically, Lloyd Richards was his mentor, his his uh, guide through those first early years, and um, he he did direct um, six of his plays. But um, as August got more sure of himself as a as a writer, as a visionary, uh, and got more comfortable in the world of the American theater, um, he went with other directors. There was um, uh, there was Walter Dallas, Marion McClinton, um, Kenny Leon, and uh, uh, post posthumously, we've had uh, uh, the director that is working with um, uh, on Jitney, who was who played Canewell in the original Seven Guitars, mm -hmm. and Seven Guitars was the first, uh, well, the last play that uh, August did with. Mm -hmm with Lloyd. Mm -hmm. And little did we know that there was this young actor there that was going to, you know, try his hand at directing. And he's the, he, he also got a Tony nomination for directing of Jitney. Um, and uh, so, so yeah, I mean, he, he also ha um, was, through the last three or four plays, he was not only, fun August was not only functioning as a, a a playwright, 
but also, you know, as somebody who chose who to work with as, mm -hmm. as a director and as a producer, you know. So he got more sure-footed and, and, and wanted more say in how his plays were. And, and were rightly so, because yeah. he, he was, I mean, the, the relation, it was Lloyd who brought him in, but after yes. that he was bringing you know, everyone else in. Exactly. exactly. Uh, you told me something earlier, and I, I, I hope you can share it with the audience, about Ruben and his vision of characters, or his sure. thinking about how they work, because that informs, I think, very, very insightfully uh, staging Wilson. Well, um, uh, Ruben, if, if there is a Wilsonian of the Wilsonians, <laughs> that's Ruben Santiago Hudson. And he, within him, he really taps into... August's cadence, rhythm, and musicality of of the language. So much so, it, it's, it's just a, it almost just pours out of him so naturally. And uh, also the understanding, I think, of of the people and the world in which these characters inhabit. Um, I was fortunately in rehearsal because I function as uh, as a producer for this production of Jenny at the Manhattan Theater Club. Uh, so I was at a lot of uh, rehearsals, and uh, one day he said, you know, all of these characters, they have something called Mother Wit. And Mother Wit is, uh, you know, you don't, you don't say one line here, and you have a character think about what that person said, and then respond. You know, mm -hmm. it is, it is, it is, it is music. One person reacts to some, somebody else, but all within this this rhythm. And why is this rhythm? Because because all the people of this of this world share a common understanding of what it is like to be an African American in in the wilderness of North America. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, and. It's it's the sense of of irony. It's a sense of humor. It's a sense of what is right and wrong. It's a sense of of having been mistreated, misjudged, and and so there's no time to to you know have those kind of Chekhovian pauses or anything like that. <laughs> um, and and it was it was like I hadn't you know I've I've been around August's work now for thirty years, mm. and I never quite heard it said that way. So so um, you know it's it's just so fun to see new people bringing new light into these plays. Yeah, and and that's going to keep them alive for forever. I, I hope so. Yeah. 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 So, do you have a favorite? <laughs> I'm going to ask if you if you have a favorite. Okay. <laughs> uh, my my favorite is is Joe Turner's Come and Gone. Yeah. And uh, I like it because of uh, the connections that he makes of African African Americans to Africans within that that it's set in 1911 and not that far removed from slavery. That that uh, um, the message of that that the play is that uh, one has to find their song. And that sense of finding yourself, finding your identity is a metaphor that speaks certainly for that disjuncture that happened after slavery, that African Americans had to find their song. But it certainly works for everyday life, that we all want to find our song. I had a friend, I, I did it, I directed it at Stanford, and a friend came to see it every night, and I said, why? And he's like, I got to find my song, man. <laughs> but um, also, uh, uh, in that production uh, um, that I did at Stanford years ago, has anybody seen the show This Is Us? Well, the actor who uh, who's in that Sterling K. Brown um, in the family, uh, the, the the son in the family, black son in the the family of This Is Us, he was in my production of um, of Joe um, as a freshman at, of of Joe Turner's Come and Gone, and was amazing in it. Um, and to see has obviously gone on to to much success uh, in terms of that. His wife was in the play too. They they dated briefly, then fell out of love. They went to NYU afterwards and got MFAs in acting um, and fell in love again, but then fell out of love. <laughs> but then the first role they both got after um, M MFAs at NYU was a husband and wife. So they said, forget it, let's just get married. And <laughs> so then, now they have two kids and they're pretty happy. But, uh, but back to Joe Turner, I think um, uh, uh, one story too that Charles Dutton talked about it, he, he talked about the fact that it was a part of playing Harold Loomis in it that just didn't leave you. 
the intensity of it, the feeling of that, and, and this guy who's eventually going to shine like new money at the end of the play, his trajectory in the play. So he couldn't, in, in terms of, you know, actors would go off stage and sit and wait for their next time. He would sit in the dark silently waiting for the next uh, scene to happen, that it was so intense. That it, and then he said the play just stayed with him, you know, after he left it as well, the intensity of it. So I'm going for Joe Turner. How about yeah, you? Yeah. Well, um, you know, for, for August, it, August Favor was also um, Joe Turner. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, seeing these plays being born like like babies in a way. It's hard to, to pick a favorite, to pick, you know, of the ones that I saw and witnessed August writing. But I would say that my favorite is Seven Guitars. And it's such a complex story mm -hmm. of, of two uh, completely different individuals. And I've al always seen it as a, as a eclipse. You know, it's just two, two, different two different people whose paths cross and somehow or other, they affect each other. Um, uh, King, uh, excuse me, Floyd mm -hmm. and King Headley, mm -hmm. and uh, then suddenly, nothing is the same again. Um, and it's uh, two, two different ways of seeing the world. That you know, um, King uh, Floyd uh, wants to be active, and uh, King Headley wants to have. Um, uh, the money delivered to him. So uh, another reason I like it is because when August wrote it, again, I, I did the same thing. I, I read it, you know, he let me read his first um, drafts and, and it was just a tiny little play. And I just said, this doesn't look like August Wilson, you know? <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't like, you know, weigh really, uh, weigh a lot in your hand. And then I, and then I learned that just like anything else, you know, you have to have the sketch before you have the painting. You have to have, you know, your, 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 your structure before you can put brick by brick by brick. And, and I saw that happening. And, uh, you know, I don't know if you guys know that one section of the, of the play, Seven Guitars, I had seven ways to go. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, the, the character said, well, I, I had all these opportunities, and they keep cutting them down, and I only need I only need now one, and the 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 strength of character that it takes to to have his opportunities cut down and still forge ahead. I feel I felt that very deeply. So mm. so that's one of the reasons that I love Seven Guitars so much. So it has, if you know the play, it has great women's parts. Within yes, it does. Yeah. Yes. And it's, it's, it's also uh, dedicated to Constanza. <laughs> mm. And rightly so. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, one of the things that, that uh, has stood out about August, and, and maybe uh, in 1996, he famously spoke to the theater communications group about the need for black theater is uh, seeing him in some ways as a race man and very, very proud that he was a black playwright, even as his plays, as we've talked about, have had universal appeal. Very much. So how did you see that, that sense of in his, his work or his understanding of race or blackness within his commitment? Well, um, August was, uh, uh, you know, he didn't care who, how many people he had you know, he was like a general, but he didn't care if he, he had a lot of soldiers. He forged ahead, and uh, he saw a great um, uh, injustice happening, which was that a lot of funding went to white theaters, and not a lot of funding went to black theaters. And so for the um, TCG uh, conference, he wrote this famous paper, which is called um, the ground on which I stand. Mm -hmm. Now, he, he touched on the fact that with bl um, blind casting, colorblind casting, you were denying the actors their own um, humanity. But the, the, main, um, the main idea behind that speech was that he wanted uh, a funding for black theaters in the United States. 
black theaters should be as healthy as white theaters. And, uh, and he boiled it down to one phrase. He said, I want a place to hang my hat. You know, once you go to a theater, let's say the Huntington, uh, and, and all of them, all the, the, the white theaters, he felt, they do the show, you know, one day he's very welcome, and after the play opens, you know, it's like, see you later, you know, go back home. But there was no theater that, uh, you know, and, and Yale came the closest, I would say, mm. Yale rep. Mm -hmm. But after he left Yale, you know, he would have liked to have had a home theater where, you know, it's like he could feel at home, just come and go, um, a place to work, and that ha be fu as funded and as, as robust as any white theater. Yeah. I remember that quote as he uh, was at the Huntington, that he right. just said, it's, it's not my home. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, but you mentioned the casting and his, his thought, which got much reaction in terms of people thinking about his idea about casting. And what I would differentiate in that comment, and I don't know if you know, is the, the difference between what I'd call colorblind casting and non-traditional casting. So colorblind casting is saying that race isn't a problem in a sense, or that we can be colorblind in casting. And we don't live in a world that's colorblind and race matters. And so to me, one of the things he was saying is exactly that. If, you're, mm -hmm. if it's colorblind, it's problematic in, in looking at it in that way. Where non-traditional casting may be taking a woman and casting her in a part which thinking about a part that women don't normally play and, and purposely doing that in a way to make you think about that. Colorblind casting is saying everything's okay and everything's not okay. Would you buy that? And yeah, I would say absolutely. Yeah, I, think. <laughs> I know it's a hot topic even now. And, and the uh, TCG conference was mm. in '96, so um, you know, still to this day, there are no black theaters that are healthy and being funded and and are out there, you know, um, on the same level, let's say, as Hartford Stage. Yeah, which is incredibly sad. It's incredibly the, sad. Yeah. Well, uh, we're going to shift gears and go to something um, that took his work in another direction, and that's uh, film and yes. the journey to uh, uh, fences to becoming a film. Yeah. So let's just start with the beginning of that. What was that like for you in terms of that, that, uh, that process to where you know, Denzel is actually doing it? Well, um, it's, it, it's quite amazing. Uh, I got a call about two and a half years ago, and uh, it was Denzel Washington, and he said, Constanza! <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's got an enormous amount of, of energy. <laughs> um, I wanted, I, I was just reflecting and me, in meditation, and I wanted to, um, uh, I wanted to find my next project, and I now feel ready to do Fences the movie, and I want to do August Proud, and I'm going to be giving you updates. And, uh, um, you know, and half a year later, boom, you know, it's, it's the beginning of the process of, of making the film Fences, and he, he kept updating me, and he said, well, um, you know, uh, we're almost ready, uh, we're going to film in, in Pittsburgh, and I said, well, is it okay if I come and, um, and be on the set while you're filming? Because I've never had that. I've never been to something like that before. And he said, oh, of course you can. <laughs> and uh, so, so I began my, and this didn't have to happen. August sold this screenplay in 1986. And uh, it, you know, Paramount Pictures and Denzel could have gone off to a little corner and never spoken to me. But they really wanted to, to have the estate uh, and, and August's, I don't know, I, I, I humbly say that I just carry the memories of August and, and I am 
always pleased when I'm included in things like that. Mm. Uh, so I went to the to the filming offenses, and I I almost stumbled into being in right in in the picture. <laughs> <laughs> I was just walking along, and I heard Gabe. You know mm. the character of Gabriel saying, "Yes, ma'am, I've got plums," <laughs> and and I was about to to make a, a U-turn when somebody said, <laughs> <laughs> and "I said, oh God, <laughs> it's too easy being on the set." <laughs> um, so uh, I I was in the set, and then I was asked to to become part of the of uh, lots of previews and screenings of the film mm -hmm. where we went to different cities and we uh, we screened the the film and uh, afterwards I did a lot of uh, questions and answers uh, and and uh, it was it was it was a, a very magical time for me mm -hmm. there was one time when um, Denzel was getting getting interviewed by himself and he doesn't like to be up there by himself uh, for the Directors Guild. And, you know, he was the director. And he said, we have Constanza Romero over here. <laughs> and then uh, he wanted me to come and join him. And, uh, and uh, so it, it was a very joyous mm -hmm. uh, experience for me. Um, uh, you mm -hmm. know, so something I, I, I will treasure forever. And, and it, was a, it was a wonderful uh, movie. You, you talked about doing August Proud. One of the things that happens in the movie is that the lines are there. You know, yes. that it's, it's, it's the play. I mean, there's a couple of uh, added lines at a couple of points to, to, yes. to help with transition, but it's his lines. Yes, yes. And uh, also the, the, the I idea here um, that in telling that story, it's, it's, it revolves around Troy, yes, and, and Troy is, is, is a man who's larger than life, but it, it's expanded from the backyard as uh, it features in the play, to the film where we've got the interaction with the house, yes? Yeah, um, I went that, that same day that I, that I almost stumbled onto the, to actually filming, um, Denzel gave me a tour through the, through the Maxon house. Um, and, uh, you know, tears came to my eyes because it was just, it was so three-dimensional. I, I, I realized I am inside August's imagination for this. This play has now become three-dimensional. You know, when you put it up on stage, you know, you see it from one vantage point and you keep on seeing it that way. But I walked through the house, through Rose's kitchen, saw, you know, like the, the, the flower there as she's making biscuits, and then um, going outside and I see the the ball tied up to the tree, you know, where where Troy practices his baseball, and and I was I was like, oh my God, this is this is August Wilson in three dimensions, mm -hmm. and it was amazing. But I really believe that the house was another character mm -hmm. in the play. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the movie, it's it was such a uh, a symbol of yes, you know, like it, it's a very humble small house. He uh, he worked as a garbage man and he worked his fingers to the bone, but he was only able to afford this house through the 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 pension and the money that his brother, who was um, um, in in the army, and, got and, and injured. And, and he was injured, so he got some money, and then they were able to buy this house. So I could see it as being, you know, the 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 sh the shelter of this family but also the reminder for Troy that he could barely afford this, this, this place. And it was, um, it was stifling for him. You know, he was bigger than that house. Uh, and, uh, and therefore, you know, you could understand maybe why he went to Alberta's, why he sought other, uh, you know, other company maybe, but, but you know, the, the fact that in, in August's words, he stole second, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. But it really, and, and then that scene where he finds out that Alberta's dead, up in that room, you know, we, we see, it, Denzel did such a good job because it, it is a scene where, you know, it, it's completely devoid of vanity. 
And then, the, you know, he opens the window and it's a big storm outside. And he talks to Mr. Death from that window, which is, windows are like, like eyes, you know? And it's, it's a, a man against the storm like King Lear. Mm -hmm. so, so I think, uh, you know, that, that, that some people spoke, well, you know, this is a movie, but we stayed in the house. But the, I mean, I, I really think that those more astute, you know, film um, viewers could see that the house had so much value yeah. to to add to the story. Yeah, and it's I, I I love the way you put that, and it's great seeing it that way. That the, how he moves, he Denzel as director moves the camera through. I I told Constanza that uh, when I first saw Fences, it was on Broadway with James Earl Jones. And as I looked over to seats, you know, I had cheap seats. I was a graduate student or something. I, I, well, no, I was, I'm not that young, so <laughs> I wasn't. So, but I looked over it, and sitting over on the, on the right-hand side were Denzel and Eddie Murphy. And I was like, I want to sit with them. They probably have it. But um, it was interesting because uh, when it was first supposed to be a movie, Eddie Murphy mm -hmm. was supposed to play the son. Yeah. So, and the way that the studios had imagined Jonathan Demme, who did the movie Diner, directing it, and this was something that August didn't want to happen at that point. And so it's been a, a long sort of trajectory to get here yeah. to where it happened. And, um, uh, and that Denzel, before he did it, did it as a play, you know, and, 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 and on, on Broadway. So it had that connection too, was, uh, was interesting in it. Uh, it's the, you mentioned uh, also um, the the publicity and the, the 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 sense that going on tour to talk about it. Um, much effort was sent into, oh, into yes. to publicizing this to really make it. And, and it's interesting because we don't often see this for black movies. You know, in the same way um, that oh. that it was for this. And it's interesting, you know, the, the, that that uh, to see it for for this movie. Yeah, um, I think that the studio Paramount, they wanted to make this an event, mm. you know, uh, and there was a lot of um, uh, cachet, I think, in, in feeling that that this is a, 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 a work, uh, a, this is a classic play. We're going to make a classic movie. And I think that Denzel really, really succeeded in that. Um, and, you know, they wanted to really underline this is an African American um, work. It's being done with all the integrity and all of the production values that that are that sh should be applied to a work of this caliber. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, they, and I think it was also their response to the year before because it was uh, the Oscar So White mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was it was the perfect project to come at the perfect time who would have thought because august sold the pl the the play and the script um 30 years before mm -hmm. yeah 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 and the constanza had uh, had put the uh, a writer from the la times was doing a story yes. on this and in, in, yeah. in touch with me to to talk about it and one of the things that uh that struck me was was uh I mentioned before, we mentioned before that he was the most produced playwright in 2016, which means that a lot of people besides black people were coming to see it and people got it as a play, you know, that it was something that had a message that was universal, cross-cultural. So why, didn't that, why does that happen differently potentially in, in films, that films something like Ordinary People, that's about a rich middle-class family in New York, gets seen as ordinary people? Why isn't that same thing about a you know fences with this black family, you know that has a, a, all the dynamics of American family drama, mm -hmm. but set in 1957, you know in Pittsburgh? So that that has to happen, and I think it, it the, the the film was successful. Very yes? successful. It made money, uh, and for them that's successful. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but I I find it on a on a artistic and. Uh, uh, you know, like a, a, a f film history, from a film history point of view, I find it very successful, and it's going to to be around, and, and people mm -hmm. are going to recognize it for a really long time. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think that one of the things that that marked the the selling of it was, you know, the the talking about the universality, you know, mm. from the the very precise and the the detailed focus of of the culture that August is talking about within that and and within the 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 classic father son relationship, we go to the uh, universal. Mm -hmm. And um, but so many white films don't have to speak about the universal. You know, let's say, did anybody from Manchester by the Sea speak about the universality of that of that film? Um, so I just wanted to. That's a good make point. That point. Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the outcomes too of this is or maybe it's not an outcome, but related is that the series of uh, the the American century cycle as a whole is going to be done. Denzel's doing it. You're working on this. Uh, HBO is bringing them mm -hmm. to the smaller screen. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We're very excited. HBO uh, wants to uh, work on five of the fir five plays. And Denzel and I will decide what five plays those are. And uh, we are co-producers. And uh, I, I'm not going to be one of those uh, widows or, ex or executors of the estate that just sits back and lets everybody do things. I want to be really, you know, at, at this point, after so many years of being the, the uh, speaking about August's plays, I, I like to to feel like I I I count and I and I want to have my experience and my knowledge um, right there. So I want to I want to be very active. Thank you. Um, in 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 um, uh, the directors in in you know I, all of the all of the plays are like jewels, different types of gemstones which need different kind of polishing, different kind of settings, different kind of 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 metals and and other uh, things to make them beautiful. So. Um, so that's where we're at. The first one we're going to do is Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it, part of it uh, is legacy in terms of it. And part of it is, it, you mentioned Denzel saying we've got to do August Proud. But hearing you talk, it's also a labor of love that shapes these, uh, Absolutely. this process now. Absolutely. There's, there's a lot, um, gosh, I can't, countless people who have devoted their lives to his work and you know, even put the best parts of themselves forward that come into the, that, that for his work. Let's say the people that worked on the film, you know, uh, I was stunned, positive, positively stunned, you know, when I was set on the set and there were a lot, you know, the whole sound team was African American. Mm -hmm. There, the mm -hmm. second director was African American, and then there were lots of Latinos and uh, people of color working backstage. And uh, and and I just said, you know, you really put your your money where your mouth is because th this really is a team effort. And and what Denzel said is that this was not like any other project mm -hmm. that th 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 those people worked on. This was special for them, and they really wanted to bring their best game, you know, their A game to the, to the table. So um, mm -hmm. it, it's that way in the world of theater as well. If, it, you know, I know so many sure. actors that are so dedicated to August's work, you know, the, those Wilsonians I spoke about, mm -hmm. but also um, there's Wilsonian um, uh, stage managers, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. directors, mm -hmm. designers, uh, you know, uh, uh, general managers of, you know, artistic directors who really are very much in the Wilson family. And, uh, and yeah, it, it, it's, it's taken all of them to make where, you know, to, to make all of this happen. That uh, brings me back to thinking about, you know, when he passed, and I'm sorry to, I mean, to, but it, because it was obviously harder on you than, anybody else, but people, the passion for him, the concern for this man who changed the American theater, who changed people's lives, as you say, the actors and directors, designers, et cetera, who worked on that, the, the plays, and, and brought a part of them to the work, 
but would transform by the work itself. Um, it was felt, uh, I remember his line when it was announced in the papers that uh, he had inoperable cancer and, and uh, liver cancer. And uh, he said, I've lived a, a blessed life. I'm ready. And the line sounded like Troy, in a sense, in, 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 yes. in Fences, so much. Um, that, uh, and, and, and he completed something that um, an other American playwrights have attempted from Eugene O'Neill and not done this American century cycle. He completed the 10 plays. The last two plays are interesting, that he had the plays of 1904, Gem of, a Vo Gem of the Ocean, and 1997, Radio Golf. And what he said in shaping them was that uh, he wanted these to be two plays on which uh, they created an umbrella in which the rest of the cycle sat. And in effect, that's what happens. The relationship between the characters in this play, they're related, literally related to the characters in this. And when you've seen that history come together, it's fascinating, amazing, powerful, transformative. What was it like, the process uh, that, uh, and, and for him in terms of radio golf at that point, the last, the last two plays, what was... Oh, gosh, that was difficult. Um, he came, um, James Bundy, who, uh, the head of the drama school who, uh, and the Yale Repertory Theater, who I adore, um, asked August to come back to Yale and uh, uh, do his last play in the American Century Cycle. And he um, he wrote it, uh, but it was it was again one of those you know it, it still needed to be developed. It still needed to be rounded out. But uh, he he came here, and uh, they started working. Um, ben Mordecai got sick at the time, and uh, he was in the hospital by the time the the play opened uh, at Yale Rep, um, and. Uh, so August complained that he was feeling odd, and then, of course, we received the diagnosis. Uh, his assistant, uh, Todd Kreidler, uh, who he had worked with for the last three plays, um, you know, worked so hard with him during those last, you know, he was diagnosed on uh, June 14th, and he died October 2nd. So. Mm. In that mm. short a time, he had one of his main goals was to finish that play. And of course, finishing that play meant um, finishing the cycle. Um, and so he worked really hard with Todd, and, and they rewrote the play and rewrote it to where it is now. Um, the, some people say that, that radio golf is not quite as, um, you know, it doesn't have quite mm. the same kind of characteristics and, and weight that the other plays do, but I, I challenge anybody, I mean, I think it's, it's a wonderful play, and I challenge anybody to, you know, contrast that play with, you know, some of the other plays that are out there that even are playing now on Broadway, because uh, it, it really summarizes the, the experience of, of the 10 plays so well. They are tearing down on Esther's house in this play, and you know, on Esther being the, the the character from the very first play, and um, and this the main character has to decide how he's going to live in the future, you know, whether it's demolishing what has been, or paying attention and learning from one from the history, and he decides to do the latter, mm -hmm. and so it was a beautiful message for living, you know, into the 21st century. Um, uh, so I think that, that he, he finished the American, the American century cycle. And, but I also always want to say he had more to do. Mm -hmm. You know, some people say, well, he came and did what he needed to do, you know, and, and, uh, you know, and yes, thank God. But he was also writing a, another play at the time. Every time he finished a play, he started another one. And uh, it was going to be a play that was outside of the American century cycle. Mm -hmm. And it was going to be made out of a different thread. That's what he wanted to do. Is, is he wanted to bring new material, new a new... Um, he was going to weave these stories a little differently. 
So, um, you know, I, I take, I'm gathering his archive and, uh, and recently I came up, I, I came across some of the notes that he had for that, the next play. Wow. So, you know, it was like, it's, it's, it's sad, but he left us with so much. Yeah, an incredible legacy. Yeah. Incredible. I think we're going to open up to questions. And uh, there's a, mics are going to come out in either aisles. And what you need to do is come to the aisles. And uh, we'll start on one side or the other in terms of that. Um, in, 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 as, that, as we line that up, uh, one thing I, I, I will ask in, or t touch in terms of legacy, certainly one of the legacies is that there is now an August Wilson Theater on Broadway. Um, yeah, yes. and uh, um, so, and, which is the only theater on Broadway for, named for an African-American playwright. <laughs> and, yeah, so. Yes. Um, please. Do we have somebody yes. here? I wonder if, if either of you could comment on how Pittsburgh lived in Mr. Wilson's soul. I, I grew up in Pittsburgh, uh, sort of not on the hill, obviously, in those days, uh, and left in my teens, after my teens, my, but my great-grandfather sold groceries on the hill in the years after the Civil oh War, gosh, before yeah. the migration. And I must say, in, in every one of his plays, I hear the voice of, uh, of Pittsburgh in it, and I don't know how that could be, because I didn't live where he lived in Pittsburgh, but there's something about the way of viewing the world that, that, that seemed to be there. And, uh, and I also want to comment very quickly on the film. The interior of that house had wooden moldings that I have never seen anywhere except in my grandmother's house in Pittsburgh. Oh wow. my God, that's, that's great. Thank such you. a great compliment for the art director. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Want to, you. Want to speak to Pittsburgh? Uh, yeah, I, uh, my, my relationship to Pittsburgh is very, um, uh, very strange. I, I grew up, uh, I was born in Colombia, South America, but then we moved to California, and you know I uh, went to UC Santa Cruz, and uh, was kind of a hippie by the time I came to uh, Yale to uh, study at the and graduate at the drama school. But the first time that August took me to Pittsburgh, it was like a different country. Mm, mm. Really, I I didn't quite understand how the different neighborhoods were so you know, so defined, and the hills, and you know, that there are actual geographic uh, borderlines, you know, with, with the neighborhoods. And so, you know, August living in the Hill District, uh, I got to walk around there, and I walked with August, so he told me, you know, there used to be a wallpaper and paint store over here, there used to be a butcher shop over here, and, uh, and uh, he, that was the place. That was the 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 place that that m formed him, you know. And I understood so much about him after I got to Pittsburgh, mm. because that Pittsburgh mm. piece of the puzzle was huge. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a working class city. It's a blue collar city. There, uh, the the racial divide between black and white is, is a different kind than what I grew up in California. So um, uh, I think August set most, uh, all his plays except one in Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And it was because he, that's what he understood. And, and that world is very, very specific, yeah. like you say. Yeah, and, and, and what's amazing is it's, it's, it's specific but in, in many ways representative of things that were happening in other places in, in the United States. Like, and, and also, if you know the history of Pittsburgh, it's very informative in terms of you know, what's gonna happen in terms of the context of the place. So one of the things that he writes about in Radio Golf, but also in uh, Two Trains Running, is the coming or the, of uh, a situation of urban renewal. And the whole idea exactly. of renewal was not something that happened in Pittsburgh, but it, in a sense, it tore apart the black community in a way. So um, that story of in, in history, as well as his own personal histories, are embedded in the fabric that is mm -hmm. um, Pittsburgh, but also speaks to in the ways we've been talking about wider. He also had little sayings and and characters from 
Pittsburgh that were well known, you know, mm -hmm. like West, mm -hmm. who was the <laughs> um, undertaker, you know. So, so we get in one of the places, you know, um, uh, something so about uh, West will dress you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, God is going to bless you, and West is going to dress you. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. things like that. That <laughs> West is, yeah. So, so those things are so specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What can you tell us about how the plays got titled? I that, uh, uh, <coughs> radio golf will be great to talk yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, my husband was in the basement where you know he had his man cave, and uh, <laughs> where he worked. Uh, and my daughter, who was about uh, seven at the time, was down there with him, and they would play little video games, and you know she would. Um, mess up the place, but it, you know, and then he, it didn't matter <laughs> because it was already kind of chaotic down there anyway. But um, August was saying, you know, I don't know what to call this play. You know, it's got, it's got, you know, somebody who plays golf, and then somebody who's going to uh, buy a radio station, and you know, he talked a little bit more about about the play, and then he, and then my daughter said, why don't you call it Radio Golf? <laughs> and that's how one of the plays at least got named. Um, the uh, uh, Seven Guitars, he, he didn't know whether he was going to call it Seven Guitars or Moon Going Down. Mm. And we were mm. sitting at a line uh, for a ferry, and I just said, August, just call it Seven Guitars. And, uh, and he said, okay. <laughs> you know, so... <laughs> yeah, and in fences is so... Is is you know self evident. Yeah, then uh, Joe Turner's Come and Gone is named for yes. uh, a song within it. Um, they tell me to Joe Turner's Come and Gone, um, and uh, that's based on an actual history. The, there was a governor, Pete Turney, not Turner Turney, who was uh, governor of Tennessee, and uh, uh, his brother Joe Turner. Uh, would come and sweep up black men and kept them in, in servitude, basically, but in indentured sort of for a period of 11 years, and that's the story. And the women would sing this refrain, and William C. Handy, you know, among others, the father of the blues, has a version of that that the, the woman would sing. He was going to call it, um, it's, it's it, one of the key influences in, in his writing was uh, the work of Romar Bearden, who was a fellow Pittsburgh artist, though they never met in life. They never met. And, mm -hmm. uh, um, but uh, there's a picture that Bearden did called Mill Hand's Lunch Bucket. And so you Google it, look at it if you, you hadn't seen it. And when you look at it, if you've seen Joe Turner, you're going to see the character Loomis sitting in there. You're going to see other things that figure within the play. So um, that relationship to, he, he really, really loved the work of uh, Bearden and felt that if he could do, and, and it, it, I hadn't thought about the visual aspect that you mentioned, the sense yes. of how the visual, if he could do in playwriting what he felt that Bearden was doing in visual art, then, then he had really had made it for himself in that way. Another work based on a Bearden painting his piano lesson. So again, if you haven't seen the picture, Piano Lesson by Bearden, the collage. It's a, a, a basically a young girl sitting at the piano with a mother figure, it looks like, over her, giving her that lesson. And so those are uh, two of the other titles it figured. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, another question. I was wondering if Denzel Washington met your husband. Yes, he did. Yeah, uh, several times. He came uh, to see the plays. And uh, they they would see each other after the plays. Uh, one time, uh, Denzel came to our house in Seattle mm -hmm. because he wanted to speak to August about his new play, and that was uh, Gem of the Ocean. Mm -hmm. he, there was a moment there where he might have played uh, the character of Citizen. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, you know, it was it was sort of like a meeting of minds. Uh, Marion McClinton was there too. And uh, suddenly, all my neighbors were out on their porches. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yes. Hi. I want to thank you all. Um, I just want to say that my first introduction to August didn't occur in the theater. It occurred in the L.A. County Jail Library. 
and I happened to be looking for anything to read, and I saw the cover of Joe Turner's Come and Gone. Mm. I got that, went back to my dorm, got on my bunk, I read that, and I was so transformed. Mm. Um, it reinvigorated my decision to be an actor. It gave me vision and purpose in the American theater because before that, it was like, what roles, you know? Mm. Um, and I got out, I took that book with me, and as a result, uh, Mrs. Wilson, we had at the Denver Center Theater Company, and I had opportunity to work with Israel Hicks. Mm -hmm. And we met at um, the Radio Golf, and we had in the green, green, green room. Yes, we had yes. I, I knew you looked a little familiar. Yes, so yeah. I just want to say that his work resonates and it's relevant not just for theater goers, but folks who, you know, men, young men like me at the time who didn't have a vision mm -hmm. for his life. And as a result, yeah. I had an opportunity to, to, uh, well, thank you for right. sharing. That's amazing. I just want to say, yeah. thank you. Very much. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. I haven't seen Fences um, before, but I know it's about baseball. But why did you name it um, Fences? Why did the play? Why is the play named Fences? Yeah. Oh gosh, um, there is uh, uh, the, the character of Rose uh, says to her husband, "I want to. I want you to build a, a, a fence around the yard." And another character says, "Some people build fences to keep people in." Some people build fences to keep people out. So it, uh, there's many symbolic reasons in, during the play for, that, that are used for fences, you know, like, like uh, Troy being fenced in to mm -hmm. the life that he, he got given, but also Rose building the fence to keep her husband in, in the home. Also, the fences that, that are the limitations mm -hmm. within everybody's life that, that, that we, we have such a hard time sometimes going beyond that fence and becoming somebody else or mm -hmm. so, you know, completing dreams that are outside of the fence. And that's, that's, yes. uh, thank you for the, it's a great question. There's a character in the play who's about your age. <laughs> <laughs> Her yes. name is Raynell, and she comes in. So you got to see it and see and see Raynell, who's a breath, a ray of sunshine within it. Um, fences. You mentioned baseball. There's also another reference to hitting it over the fence, and can you escape beyond those limitations? Yes, exactly. And then um, the the names in the play are interesting. Rose, like the flower rose, and she eventually blooms. Um, or uh, Troy. Troy, like the city of Roy, Troy, which had a fence or wall around it, and then the wall comes tumbling down around Troy. I mean, his his world. And and if you've seen um, the 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 film, when you do see the film, I think that's a wonderful scene too. Um, then after the walls have tumbled and Troy has just not been, and the Friday rituals that he had around getting his check, bringing it to Rose, everything is just not there, and he's mm -hmm. sitting in the bar drinking. Yeah. You know, and, uh, yeah. and Bono comes up. So yeah. thank you. Great question. Yes. Thank you, honey. Um, we, we all wish that we had seen his work year after year into the present because he had so much to say. Um, the thing that I was so struck with was something that Ruben Santiago Hudson did do, which he called an 11th play when he performed it in New yes, York. Yes, that's and I uh, how I learned what I learned. Exactly, and mm -hmm. I wonder whether you could tell us something about that, how he put it together. Oh it was an amazing piece. Mm -hmm. Well, um, August one day told me, I'm going to do stand-up. <laughs> <laughs> going, are you kidding me? He says, yeah, I, you know, like a one-man play. And I said, you, you never want to have a schedule. How are you going to show up for the show? 
<laughs> and I think that it was partly um, to make, to, to prove me wrong. Um, he, he wrote a one-man show. Uh, and he said, the one thing I know is that it's not going to be autobiographical. And then uh, time goes on, and he's really, you know, it's, it's like he really has to sit down and start to figure out what he's going to do. And he said, the one thing I know is that it's going to be biographical. <laughs> 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 and uh, it basically, it's a portrait of August as a young man. And uh, it's called How I Learned What I Learned. And uh, it really, uh, it's, a, it's just a lovely uh, journey with him to um, mm -hmm. see all of the lessons that he learned as a young man, both from you know his mother, the the uh, the fellow artists of his community, and the um, you know as I said before uh, the 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 kind of limitations that were existent for a young black man in the '60s, and you know what kind of jobs they could get, what kind of opportunities. So he speaks about all of that. Um, Harry, when it came up to see August perform it himself. Yeah, it was amazing seeing him perform. It was uh, the last time I, I, I saw him in person and I, he was so generous in so many ways. He gave me a big beer hug, you know, um, and uh, uh, I mean, the play, what I'd say also about it and it, um, is that it talks about, uh, he talks about the integrity of life and the choices mm -hmm. he made that you had to the that respect. that yeah that that was that was a important part of his decision making now you in terms of decision making of letting it be done could you talk a little bit about that yeah um 10 years went by after august and um his assistant todd directed him in this in this play and i said todd you know um august wanted us to to continue with this uh piece what are we going to do? And, and he said, oh, I'm not ready yet. And I said, well, you know, it's, uh, they, they want to do it at the Signature Theater. And uh, uh, he, he, August himself had chosen Ruben Santiago Hudson to play August Wilson in, in the one-man show. Mm -hmm. And the, the lessons and the, and the, the, the kind of historic um, wisdom that, it, that you learn from this play... <sighs> I just told him, we, we can't let that go by. Yeah. And so he, you know, said, okay. And uh, that's the show you saw. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And now we, um, as we speak, there is a production of it happening at uh, the Roundhouse in D.C., uh, being performed by another actor named Eugene Lee, mm -hmm. also Good directed actor. by Todd. I, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, this will be our final question. Thanks. I don't have uh, the many plays I've seen well enough in mind to be able to name these characters, but uh, the character Gabe is one of them. It sounds like you played a character like him. I'm thinking of a, I don't even remember which play it is, where Fences. he says, uh, uh, I want my ham, I want my ham, oh, he's going to give yeah. me my ham. Two There's trains all, running. Two trains running. It's two handball. trains running. Okay, and it seems like in many of his plays, there's a character like that, and I'm curious as to, uh, he seemed to need to put a character like that in there, somebody who's, who was touched in some way, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So if, if I can deal with that, and then Please. you, and it's, I, I, I spent a chapter writing about this, so it's one of my favorite uh, <laughs> subjects. Definitely, uh, um, take it away. So you know the phrase, um, God's looks out for fools and babes? Um, so these characters are, as you say, in some ways, seemingly inhibited. But in Wilson's world, they're, it's, they have license. They have more ability in some ways. So Gabe, in effect, is the arch angle, age, angle, arch angel, excuse me, not angle, <laughs> Gabriel. I mean, he is that in the sense that he's going to reconcile the family. So here's this character seemingly, you know, who's been injured in the war, seemingly now is handicapped, uh, and, you know, it has one track, but 
is able to bring and reconcile the family together at the end of the play. That, and, and if you've seen the movie or seen the play, that scene is really, really powerful. I think Denzel has done a wonderful job in terms of uh, what he does in that final moment because it, the, the script reads that the gates of heaven open as wide as God's closet. Now, if you as a director get that as a script, you know, well, well, I do what? <laughs> but Denzel got it, and, and that's what happens. But Gabe is the person who makes it happen. So similarly, in Hambone, we've got a character who says doggedly, I want my ham, I want my ham, I want my ham. And one time, Wilson talked about the fact he wanted audiences thinking about saying that, you know, I want my ham. And what the line is in the play, Holloway and Memphis are talking, and in their conversation, they talk about the fact that Hambo may have it more together than us because he's not going to let go of that ideal, what he really wants and wants to, that would, and what he deserves. And what had happened was that he painted the fence for this white butcher, and the white butcher said, if you do it well, I'll give you a ham. If you don't, you know, I'll give you a chicken. And he gave him a chicken, but Hambo knew he'd done it well. So if you translate it, it's much like uh, what was owed to blacks after slavery, 40 acres and a mule, which they didn't get. You know, but Hambone doesn't give up as black people. So there's a comment there. Did you know he gave up on this vision? And Hambone dies within the play. And and when his back is revealed, he has scars on it, much like a slave. You know, in the, from slavery in terms of it back. So again, that sense that here's a character who pushes beyond the limitations of uh, rather than someone who seems in, limited by this the way he says this one phrase. So we see, I mean, so this is something we see repeated in, in Wilson, and we also see his repeated use of children. You know, so I mentioned Raynell, and Raynell is a character who comes into Fences at a time when you're not supposed to come into a play in traditional writing of a plays, right? You don't bring a character in in the last scene. But he does with Raynell, and he does, and, and, and she is that breath, her name Raynell, like a, a ray of sunshine within it. And she's able to help her brother reconcile Corey and think about the fact he's going to go to his father's funeral. And they sing this song that is this sense of a cultural memory that they have together, this old dog blue song that they sing together. We see kids also in Joe Turner's Come and Gone. And here, Zonia uh, and her friend Rumid. Ruben is actually named after uh, a friend that the uh, Romar Bearden had. Um, they, too, act as commentary on what's happening within the play and reveal a different side to what's action. So really, he took care with those two things. Um, and, and if you read them throughout the uh, cycle of plays, it's, it's interesting, the stories he's trying to tell through them or the power that they have through their difference. Yeah, I think you did it really well, Harry. <laughs> I don't know if I can add to that. <laughs> so, I, I, in, in closing, I'm, I'm sorry for going off on that, but it's one of my favorite subjects, as, as you probably could tell. In closing, I really want to say thank you to Constanza um, oh. for and, and all she's done oh. to keep August Wilson's legacy alive. Thank you. So, please, give me a hand. Thank you. You too. <laughs>